Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Well, guys, we have a powerful, what is over here at the Watchers, uh, listed as a 7.7, which we are showing on the USGS as a 7.5 uh, earthquake that hit Sulawesi in Indonesia. Uh, tsunami warning was issued, and this is shallow. So as far as looking at it over here, they're listing it as a 7.5, 10 kilometers deep. And so it is a shallow uh, earthquake. It's a very powerful one. It comes right on the heels of a 6.1 that was also sh uh, shallow in the same area. And uh, unfortunately, we, we do have video of a tsunami coming in. And this one right here, this is out of the mirror. And um, you know, I'll let you guys play it. It is uh, definitely scary. It's not for the faint of heart. As it comes in slowly from the from the shore, it, I think people underestimated how much water is coming. You see f houses that are, they look like they're damaged from the earthquake in the forefront, basically right there on the beach. And then as the water comes in, it just ob obliterates them totally, and the people run panicked. So um, watch it at your own discretion uh it's, it's definitely something that is a very scary thing to see but also just to let you know and let everybody know you know how you could get caught off guard with these things because it didn't seem like people realized how much water was rolling in until it was right on top of them and uh at that point anybody on the beach it was just too late and the people that are filming this are up up higher off uh, the beach and then you could see the water rushing by on the other side as well as later on in the film another uh, view of it so uh, a major earthquake in Indonesia again uh, 7.5 this one's shallow and again shallow earthquakes give you more damage larger uh, deeper earthquakes those will usually end up causing more earthquakes later on downstream as far as the way that the tectonic plate uh, action goes but this one did generate a tsunami and you could see it coming in and uh, you know there is loss of life although we don't see we don't know what it is uh, yet there there definitely is uh, by, by looking at the tsunami coming in <laughs> excuse me uh, definitely a very scary scary scene and you, and you could definitely hear the people panicking as they go and so um, we'll pray for those people and pray for all in Indonesia Indonesia is definitely one of the areas on the planet that has the most big earthquakes it's a very very uh, seismic active zone obviously in the ring of fire and um, this is definitely not something you want anybody to go through. And so, again, 7.7 uh, 7 initially, 7.5 according to USGS now, causing a tsunami. And when we take a peek, we also have a 5.6 off of Martinique. Uh, not quite antipodal to Indonesia. Uh, the antipode for the Sulanese one is actually uh, in northern Brazil, but... Still, it just made me wonder if it was an antipode. And um, and you can see that one over here. There's also a 4.4 over in Italy and a 4.0 in Turkey. As you see, the big one here, the 7.5, which there are many aftershocks going on in the fives. And so we also have powerful Typhoon Trammy slamming into Japan with life-threatening impacts. And this should happen sometime uh, in the next uh, day or so. Uh, it's Saturday, Saturday p.m. it's going to start to hit the um, islands like through Okinawa. It's basically going to curve around and start heading to the northeast as we had spoken of before. Right now it's currently a Category 3 um equal to a category three hurricane it's a typhoon because of the location and so this area obviously japan has been just devastated uh, with one storm after another 
on top of everything that's going on. You know, so Japan's going to get another blast again. And this is basically going to just curve and go straight up through uh, Japan. The entire uh, islands is what they are forecasting. So again, you're going to have extreme risk of flooding, destructive rain, uh, winds, mudslides, storm surge. Uh, not a good situation. Dangerous seas, you know, in excess of 34 feet. They were actually measured quite a bit higher previously. But this is not a good situation for an area that's been hit so many times already. Uh, this has been an extremely rough summer for Japan. And in Greece, uh, they're preparing for Storm Zorba. And, and it's basically a Medicane, another Medicane, Mediterranean hurricane. And um, this is going to be impacting the Greek Isles. And they're warning people not to go out into the streets in the next few days unless it's absolutely necessary. And of course, this is named after the film, you know, Zorba the Greek. And so the conditions are expected to worsen Friday, affecting the island of Crete, the Cyclones Islands, the Peloponnese Peninsula, and other parts of the southern and western mainland. Winds are expected to reach up to about 62 miles per hour. And so it's going to be a rough one for them over there. We have winter officially arriving in one Swedish town with five consecutive days of sub-zero average daytime temperatures. And that is Sweden's official, official meteorological definition of winter. So winter has started on September 23rd in Sweden, which is um, far earlier than average. Usually it comes sometime in October for the mountains. And we have scientists. Do you remember Uamuamua? or Um Mua Mua. This was that rock that many people believe, um, well, we're saying rock, many people believe it was actually a ship because of its, not only its, um, its size and shape, which would be exactly what you would expect for an interstellar uh, ship, but also the way it came in and slingshotted around the sun and took off from a different direction than we typically see. and exactly how people would use, how intelligent beings would use a star to create more speed and momentum. So, you know, this is this still more of a cover-up. Now, this is out of live science, which ultimately, yes, this is kind of mainstream. It's, it's basically going to um, be coming from the same people that give us NOAA and NASA. So, you know, we have to look at this critically, of course. And so ever since astronomers spotted it, Oumuamua, you know, it's had a lot of questions. And so they are now saying that they know where it basically came from. And so uh, looking at the data and the trajectory and everything, they're trying to figure out where did it possibly come from and originate from? Well, their, their best guess, guesses is a red dwarf, HIP 3757. That's a red dwarf sun. Another sun-like star, HD 292249. And then possibly two other stars without manageable nicknames as yet. So these are the stars that they think probably birthed it. And it's interesting because um, the Hawaiian word, um, mua, mua means messenger from afar, arriving first. So what are they hinting at there? And they do hint at things. You know, when, when you have an agency that names something Enlil out of Sumerian mythology, you know, and then here they're giving it a Hawaiian name, and Hawaii has dominated our attention with the eruption that we had going on at Kilauea for over three months. Interesting, right? And now there's the name that they give it means messenger from afar arriving first. So what's arriving next? Blue Kachina, Red Kachina. Is that what they're hinting at? Nibiru? And, you know, some will laugh it off. Others will say, uh, yeah, of course, because they have to disclose. They always have to disclose. 
So Umuamua, the messenger arriving from afar, arriving from possibly a red dwarf, yet arriving first in Hawaiian. Very interesting, to say the least. And so this new research is described in the paper posted September 24th to the preprint site, and it gives it out there. And it's been accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal. Very interesting. The messenger from afar arriving first. Is there consciousness after death? And this is one of our, this is from one of our family, and he's a very interesting uh, person that has a, basically a, a really interesting theory on how storms and everything we see electromagnetically in our air, especially storms. Storms are manifestations of something going on in the interior of the planet. And so he's, he's sent me a lot of interesting things uh, over the months. And this one is, is there consciousness after death? Exploring the theory of orchestrated objective reduction. Or, or, and, and this is very, very interesting stuff and makes a lot of sense. So, of course, anytime you get truth, you'll get... You know, people trying to uh, debunk it. And so this is getting into some of the science and quantum physics behind consciousness. So in past times, those of us who believe in higher consciousness have been ridiculed. Those who practice astral projection, experience lucid dreaming or deep meditation that transcends the physical realm. Those of us who experience contact with spirits or higher beings psychics mediums we always get the woo woo comments or funny looks even us brain wave entrainment enthusiasts get laughed at on occasion by those who have no idea of the science behind frequency response and how different frequencies change the way we think and feel and indeed how frequencies control the natural world to think outside societal norms requires a thick skin we go with our intuition, with what seems plausible. We trust in science, which tends to catch up eventually and prove that we aren't living in la-la land. So how about this for a conversation with your friends then? Imagine if consciousness exists outside the body. I mean, have you ever questioned where consciousness comes from? Where do thoughts come from? How do they appear in the brain or mind? You can't think thoughts. You can't stop thinking either. There is seemingly no filter. Well, you can stop it if you really do um, and basically pay attention to meditation and practice on a regular basis and when you do stop the brain from firing like that and switch it into a different gear then the expansiveness of of consciousness sets in and your reality changes forever and so it's just a matter that in our culture it's it's something that most people don't take the time and and don't have the discipline to do so it can be done and then you know you don't have to use conjecture you just know so it makes sense that it's possible that thoughts are put into our heads rather than created in a system within the mind perhaps the brain is simply a catalyst for the projection of thoughts and consciousness that's being drawn from an external source a higher being something bigger a master computer perhaps so he has been thinking about this stuff since he was a kid by nature i questioned everything orchestrated objection reduction objective reduction and it's called orc or so when i heard about the theory of orc or or orchestrated objective reduction i was intrigued the theory provides a scientific framework, as yet disproven, that consciousness manifests in living things through quantum microtubules in the brain and is not a byproduct of the brain itself. So what does that mean? Basically, it means that microtubules in the brain and the bodies of simple cell organisms like paramecium, which exhibit behaviors of consciousness, are acting like antenna for consciousness. And that consciousness is actually a non-local property. And, and that is the reality of it. And it is, we get that basically through all the mystery traditions that go back thousands of years. And it probably go back to much higher societies, much more advanced uh, time periods. And, you know, it's just an accepted thing through these um, traditions. And also, it's taught how to experience it. 
So, imagine there are little antennas in your brain receiving signals from an external source, and the brain processes the signals into thoughts and emotions, consciousness. Orchestrative objective reduction was first put forward in the mid-1990s by eminent mathemati mathematical physicist Sir Roger Penrose and prominent anesthesiologist Stuart Hameroff, MD. They suggested that quantum vibrational computations in microtubules were orchestrated orc, by synaptic inputs and memory stored in microtubules and terminated by objective reduction, hence orc or. Microtubules are major components of the cell structural skeleton. This theory was harshly criticized from its inception as the brain was considered too warm, wet, and noisy for seemingly delicate quantum processes. However, evidence has shown, now shown, warm quantum coherence in plant photosynthesis, bird brain navigation, our sense of smell, and brain to microtubules. Nature always proves us wrong, doesn't she? The recent discovery of warm temperature, quantum vibrations, and microtubules inside brain neurons by the research group led by Anurband Bandi Padhaye a PhD at the National Institute of Material Sciences in Suka, Tsukuba, Japan, and now at MIT, corroborates the pairs theory and suggests that EEG rhythms also derive from deeper level microtubule vibrations. In addition, work from the laboratory of Roderick G. Ekenhoff, uh, Ekenhoff MD at the University of Pennsylvania suggests that anesthesia, which selectively erases consciousness while sparing non-conscious brain activities, acts via microtubules and brain neurons. So in short, yes, it's absolutely possible we have a quantum soul. And so the thinking now goes one step further, suggesting that healing may be a non-local process too, or at least assisted by external source. So does that mean that there's consciousness after death? In terms of life after death, this would mean that consciousness may remain when the individual entity or identity that is associated with the body perishes. This lends itself to the theory of collective conscious universe. So wait, what? So those, those of us who have been saying all these years that we are interconnected that we all experience a collective consciousness through a different vessel, a body, we're laughed at. Could be right? Indeed. It makes absolute sense. In fact, in a study by Sam Parnia, head of a research team at Southampton University, published in the official journal of European Resuscitation Council with the title Aware Awareness During Resuscitation, a prospective study which included more than 2,000 persons who suffered cardiac arrest and who successfully responded to recitation treatment in 15 hospitals in the UK, United States, and Austria found that 40% who survived a cardiac arrest were aware during the time they were, they were clinically dead and before their hearts were restarted. One in five said they had felt an unusual sense of peacefulness, while nearly one third at the time said time had slowed down or speeded up some recalled seeing a bright light, a golden flash, or the sun shining. Others recounted feelings of fear or drowning or being dragged through deep water. 13% said they had felt separated from their bodies, and the same number said that their senses had been heightened. So Parnia believes that contrary to perception, death is not a specific moment, but a potentially reversible process that occurs after any severe illness or accident causing the heart, lungs, and brains to cease functioning. Hard proof of consciousness after death would be the holy grail for the unknown about consciousness, and we are getting there. And then this is a uh, video below that you can listen to, and this is by Sir Roger Penrose. But this, this all goes in line with what we've you know, learned through the mystery traditions and through the indigenous people and also, the Eastern traditions, where it's all been out there in the open, um, it's it's just that you know in the West they seem to have to understand the actual mechanisms before understanding you know the reality, the greater reality. So they always want to you know reductionism, break it down into the smallest uh, components in order to understand it. 
but yes we are all connected part of one greater reality one greater consciousness and this is source god whatever you want to call it and so we are all individual waves in the same ocean and eventually it's it's going to hit everybody that that is the ultimate reality of it and uh, we are discovering more all the time things are coming through more all the time and it truly is amazing and really it's it's all positive and nothing to fear at all as uh, Winston Churchill said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, because ultimately consciousness is reality. And consciousness, you know, it's, it can't be created or destroyed like energy, because it is a form of energy. It just changes, always changing. So there's nothing really to fear in all this. And many of us have realized in our lives that we are not the body. The body is the vehicle. As the Bhagavad Gita says, worn out bodies are discarded by the user just as worn out garments are discar discarded by the user. And so, death, where is your sting? As it says from the Bible, as that will be conquered as well. So my friends, as always, stay safe out there. May you guys always be blessed with abundant peace, love, health, and well-being. As always, thumbs up to support the channel. Please do share with as many people as possible to wake them up. And always join the family. Click the bell. You know, subscribe. Get all the notifications. Stay on top of everything that's going on. May you guys be blessed always. God bless and namaste.